Um, what is the other language we have, uh, uh, Matthias? Remember Spanish as Spanish. well? Spanish. Spanish, and we've got French um, interpretation for those of you who want to go and uh, tick the language you prefer. Uh, now we start, and basically I start with just a few um, opening remarks. Uh, again, good morning, uh, good afternoon, good evening, uh, depending on which part of the world you are in. Um, this digital conference, uh, which we um, as the IOE are organizing jointly with the Working Capital Fund is something we've been looking forward to for a while. My name is Mtunzi Mdwaba, uh, the Vice President of the International Organization of Employers. And I also chair the IOE Policy Working Group on Human Rights and Responsible Business Conduct. Dan Widerman, um, who was here with us, the Managing Director of the Fund, will introduce his organization a bit later on the agenda and will also be moderating the innovative digital solutions panel discussion thereafter. For those of you who don't know the IOE, we are the global voice of employers. Our members are the representative business and employer organizations in around 150 countries, representing more than 50 million companies. The IOE has been deeply engaged on human rights issues and in the fight to eradicate forced and child labor for a long time. The IOE has just pledged to intensify the work on child labor, given that this year is the international year of the eradication of child labor. My colleague, Rita Yip from the IOE Secretariat will introduce our pledge in a minute. Today, we want to focus on two main issues. First, we want to understand from two federations, the Vietnam Chamber of Commerce and Industry and the US Council of International Business. What are lessons that have been learned in the policy agenda for the eradication of child labor? Of course, we have business and employer organizations playing different roles in efforts to eradicate child labor and promote responsible business conduct. They engage with policy makers, they raise awareness and build capacity of their member federations, and they directly shape labor market frameworks. Thus, we want to hear from the experiences of two federations in two very different regions. The exchange with these two federations is part of a larger effort by the IOE to promote peer learning between federations, particularly from the Alliance 8.7 Pathfinder countries. As most of you probably know, the Alliance 8.7 is a global partnerships partnership to scale up and coordinate efforts for reaching the goal to eradicate forced and child labor. The Alliance 8.7 Pathfinder countries are those that committed to take extra steps in this regard. Secondly, we want to hear from five relatively young companies that have developed digital solutions to support companies to identify and respond to human rights risks in their operations and supply chains. I will not waste time here to introduce these five companies in the interest of time, as you shall soon hear from them when Dan is moderating a bit later. Just to say that digital solutions can play an important role in addressing some of the challenges global companies face when trying to ensure that there's no child labor or decent work deficits in their supply chains. Of course, such digital solutions are always only one piece in a larger puzzle and will not replace the action which is necessary on the ground to address the root causes of child labor and decent work deficits. These root causes are, for instance, poverty, insufficient social protection, weak governance, and lacking access to education. However, innovative and digital solutions are nevertheless important, particularly in view of the challenges which many companies face with regards to conducting social audits and human rights due diligence during this COVID pandemic period. With travel largely suspended, businesses have been unable to visit suppliers and conduct on-site audits, making the identification and management of adverse human rights impacts in the supply chain even harder. Here, the solutions of these companies can help a great deal. With this colleagues, I hand over to Rita to introduce the IOE's pledge on addressing child labor. 
Over to you, uh, Rita. Thank you, Matunzi, um, and good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to everyone um, who joined us today. So as Matunzi has said, um, the UN declared this year as the International Year for the Elimination of Child Labour, and um, to contribute to this special year, IOE made a pledge in January to launch an initiative called the Leaders Initiative to End Child Labour, and it focuses on three strategic commitments. Firstly, to engage and collaborate with IRE members from the Alliance 8.7 Pathfinder countries to accelerate further efforts so that they can go further and faster to achieve the target 8.7. Secondly, um, is to showcase innovative private sector approaches for eradicating child, la child labor. And thirdly, is um, to strengthen peer learning and capacity building among IOE Pathfinder countries and IOE partner companies. In addition to this, IOE has planned um, lots of events and activities throughout the year. And one way which we are most proud of is to present the International Elimination of Child Labor Changemaker Award, which, is going to, which will be awarded to an employer organization that has developed an innovative, sustainable and impactful way to tackle child labor in their country. We've opened the entries um, this month and it's, it's throughout the deadline closes on the 30th of April. We look forward to receiving all the applications um, and entries. And um, we also look forward to um, um, everyone's participation to our events and activities um, th planned throughout this year. So for more information about our initiative and uh, the events that are planned and also about the Changemaker Award, please visit our website or contact Matthias or myself. Um, we will happy to share with you all the information. Thank you. Rita, thank you so much. Much appreciate. So between Rita and myself, We've saved you lots of time, Gabriella and, uh, <laughs> and Guyen. So it's up to you now to keep this going so that everybody in Asia can sleep early. So over to you, uh, Nguyen, you are first to go. Um, as we know, colleagues that have just connected, the agenda now that we are dealing with for the panel is relating to the policy agenda for the eradication of child labor, what works and what doesn't. And these are views from the two employer organizations. Over to you, Nguyen. Thank you, thank you very much. Uh, good evening from Hanoi and uh, hello to everybody because uh, uh, we know that, that you, uh, we are come, uh, uh, coming from all over the world to participate uh, in, in, this, in this very important uh, event. You know, uh, just uh, firstly, I would like to thank you, IOE, you know, for inviting me uh, we Vietnam Chamber of Commerce and Industry to participate and to make presentation on the uh, very important the child, labor, child labor issue uh, today. And I also understand that I have um, maximum seven and a half minutes uh, for my presentation, so I will uh, go very quickly. Uh, my PowerPoint presentation also has been sent to uh, to you so that you can. Uh, you know about you know you can read it and then and then go it very uh, go through it very quickly. Uh, you may know that the current situation of child labor in Vietnam, you know, it's already mentioned that 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 the um, we have a lot of, of child labor, not you know a lot compared to the other uh, country in 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 uh, in Asia in ASEAN, but you know. One important point I want to highlight now is that the child labor rate, you know, in Vietnam is quite low. Uh, it's low average compared to the uh, the regional and global rate. And that 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 the um, the second point that you know the the child labor mainly are in the informal sector. So that that all about the you know the current situation. Um, the, on the child labor in Vietnam and uh, and Vietnam, uh, I also want to to share with you that Vietnam's effort to address the child labor uh, that that in you know we we plan to gradually complete the national framework and policy on child labor prevention and uh, reduction uh, in compliance with the international standard. And it's that content also mentioned in, in our 
recently revised labor law. And we also, you know, try to formulate and implement program on child labor prevention and reduction. So that, that has been, you know, uh, implementing so far. And uh, the communicate and, and uh, also advocate the participant of the party committee, government, uh, agency, business, uh, in, and, and, you know, uh, different key stakeholder in 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 society to prevent the child labor and 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 to protect the the, the child right and uh, we also promote global integration trade uh, liberalization you you may know that vietnam has joined more than 15 fta the future trade, um, trade agreement in which uh, uh, CP, uh, TPP and uh, Vietnam European EVFTA are two new generation of FTAs and that also emphasize the need for the elimination of child labor in trade. So um, we, we have been um, doing a lot, you know, with uh, a lot of effort of Vietnam has been um, mentioned and, and implementing and one important uh, point I want to share with you is that that since the year 2015, when the leader of the president of Vietnam, together with the other 191 uh, leader of the member of the United Nations, we gather in uh, in New York on the 25th of, of September 2015 to uh, adopt the uh, the 17 SDG, the Agenda 2030, and right after that, you know, we also, you know. Uh, work uh, internally within Vietnam, and we also approve our VSDG. We call you know Vietnam, you know SDG in in which you know we also you know uh, very very much emphasize the 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 the, um, the SDG, including the SDG eight point seven. So that that you know. Uh, very briefly to share with you about, you know, <clears throat> you know, Vietnam, the current situation of child labor in Vietnam and, and the Vietnam's uh, Vietnam uh, effort to, you know, address and to, um, uh, to address the child labor issue. So now we move to the second point of, the, of my presentation is that the VCCI, you know, effort with the businesses, you know, VCCI in the partnership, with businesses, uh, business association, you know, in Vietnam to address the, the child labor and, you know, our effort, you know, try to prevent and to end the child labor in all of kind of, 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 um, uh, of child labor in Vietnam. And you may know that, you know, that VCCI is, is, is uh, national, the biggest uh, national trade and investment promotion organization in Vietnam. And uh, we also, you know, the representative, the voice of the private sector in Vietnam. And we uh, have, unlike in European country or in the US, we have uh, the only chamber of commerce and industry here in Hanoi with the uh, with VCCI branches and representative offices throughout the country. We have, uh, you know, this year we are going to celebrate our 58th year of establishment in in in, in the in the next month you know the, the 27th of april will be the birthday of vcci for the 58 years old so that that's very important day for us and we call the innovation day the day you know we work together to innovate you know together so we we uh, we have more than 100,000 members, and that also includes uh, some hundred of uh, business association in, in Vietnam. So that makes the number of, of, of the member company, the corporate member of VCCI increase. So over the last uh, years, we work very closely with um, the International Labor Organization on the project called Enhancing the National Compactity to Prevent and reduce the uh, child labor in Vietnam. We call it enhanced project. So that you know, mainly we um, that that the one of the department or unit of VCCI uh, we call Bureau for Employer. Um, we uh, provide guidance tool for employers 
uh, on prevention of child labor at workplace. And the second, you know, uh, activity that, that, that the Bureau for Employers doing that um, we have with, you know, to be up with the, uh, the Code of Conduct for employers on prevention and elimination of all kinds of child labor in Vietnam. And guiding, we also, you know, provide guiding document for trainer, training trainer, you know, workshop for enterprises and for business association in Vietnam on, on, on the issue, especially, you know, how to guide the, um, uh, the business association to deal with the, you know, uh, the, the, with the prevention at, uh, of child labor in Vietnam. And uh, we also, you know, see, if you, see, you look at my presentation, you see a lot of training courses. We organize a lot of, you know, training courses in Vietnam, you know, the uh, training course uh, for, you know, we call resource trainer, who was expert and lecturer on the industrial relation representative of businesses, as a business association and inter enterprises. So we organize a lot of events, seminars, to introduce a set of documents uh, to the relevant uh, ministries, department, agency, and business association. So that, that, that we are doing what, you know, that the Bureau, you know, uh, office for employers are doing. And uh, the, the second cluster of activity that we are doing, you know, not just about 17 SDG and the role of the private sector in implementation of uh, uh, 17 SDG agenda 2030 in Vietnam, but, um, one, one thing I would like to share with you is that, that, you know, right after the 17 SDG has been uh, approved and we at VCCI in Vietnam, we work with different ministry, Ministry of Labor, Invalid and Social Affairs and, you know, Ministry of Natural Resources. We, we work with, you know, United Nations organization. We work with ILO and uh, to be up a kind of, you know, we call that corporate. Uh, sustainability index and with the permi uh, permission of the prime minister vcci is allowed to um, use our uh, csi we call the corporate sustainability index to benchmark the uh, top sustainable company in vietnam and that that csi at the tune of you know very very, very important tune in vietnam the first ever index in vietnam um, which used to measure the level of the sustainability of the, of, of the businesses in Vietnam. And we, the, the, the CSI cover not only economic, you know, financial issue, but also social and environmental issue. And in social, we are in an um, uh, area, we are always update, you know, our, our, uh, the content of the businesses. And uh, one of the uh, very important, you know, issue, the issue we are talking about right now is that about the, the children, uh, the child labor and the children right also, you know, have been updated in, in our CSI. And in the picture, you can see a lot of minister and the vice president of Vietnam uh, to come to the benchmarking, uh, the announcement awarding ceremony of the top sustainable company, I think in, in last year, and where we embrace, you know, the best practices of, 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 uh, of businesses on, on child labor prevention and workplace. And um, very quickly, but last but not least, that the, pro that the project we are working with UNICEF in Vietnam, we call promoting general rights in businesses. And um, I, I think that, you know, we, we are doing a lot of activity in collaboration with very close uh, collaboration with uh, UNICEF Vietnam and UNICEF um, at regional level to conduct a survey on children rights and business principle at the workplace. Uh, found that, you know, you see a lot of, a lot of effort, you know, yeah, has been given to com comply with the with the child labor prevention and best practices um, in Vietnam, and we also public Vietnamese version uh, we call for family friendly policy 
you know, UNICEF handbook for businesses, which cover the topic related to the protect um, child labor. And, and I think that if you want to see more about the, 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 the work that we have been doing with UNICEF and other business associations in Vietnam, you can see, you can go to the, uh, the website of, 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 the, um, of the program that, that we are working now, we're now working on with UNICEF. And what we are going to do in the future, I, I don't know how much time I left, um, we, uh, left but you, you know. You, you, you don't have any time left, Nguyen. It was finished All three right, minutes so, ago. So I will can stop here, but uh, the, the last, the last, uh, the last um, slide is very important that we, we you know, highlight what we are going to do in the future. So I, I think that you, you may all you know, may all know that, well, but one thing that I want to emphasize here is that we will work closely with I, uh, OE, you know, to, to promote the, uh, the, 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 the gender right and then to promote the, the activity of the project. Thank you very much for your, for your attention. Thank you very much, Nguyen. We'll come back, of course, and have opportunity later to, for you to elaborate as well. I'm happy you mentioned the role of the ILO uh, because the ILO is doing a very, very good job uh, with the ILINES 8.7 to make sure that everything goes well. What I forgot to mention as well is that if you've got, uh, if you are in, available on Twitter, of course, you can provide your, your Twitter handle on the side. I know some of them, the USCIB I know and the IOE of course I know, um, but you can also give for the VCCI and the Working Capital Fund if you have on the side so that we can include you in our tweets. Um, and mine is at Tizoro one So if you're looking because I've been tweeting all, all throughout. Gabriela, over to you, but to be fair to you, I'll also give you 10 minutes like I gave Nguyen because we'd saved you time. So <laughs> you use it the Thank way you, you want. Thank you very much. Thank you. Over to you, Gabriela. Thank you. Thank you, Vice President uh, Matinzi Mdwaba. Um, and on behalf of uh, the United States Council for International Business, I'd like to thank today's organizers, the International Organization of Employers, and the Working Capital Fund for hosting this important event. And we're honored to join distinguished speakers and panelists today um, in discussing shared approaches to the challenge and our shared commitment to the fight to eliminate child labor globally. Uh, the timing for today's event is very important because as we heard this year, 2021 has been designated the International Year for the Elimination of Child Labor. So this is a critical year for all of us for action. Many of you um, may also be aware that just in August of 2020, ILO Convention 182 on the Worst Forms of Child Labor became the first universally ratified ILO Convention. So that means all 187 ILO member states have formally committed to that important global standard. Um, since uh, I Convention 182 was first adopted back in 1999, we have seen a lot of great progress in the global fight to bring an end to child labor. For example, between 2000 and 2016, we saw a drop in child labor rates um, or incidences of 40%. So that's great progress. But on the other hand, the ILO estimates that there is still approximately 152 million children in child labor today. And 73 million of them are in hazardous work. So progress is, um, has taken place, but it's slowing. And we also worryingly have observed um, that during this unexpected global pandemic of COVID-19, it's created an increase in the risk of uh, child labor and forced labor due to the pandemic's impact on employment, insufficient social protection, and weak systems for labor inspection. So this is the year we have challenges. Um, and um, with this context in mind, what is the role of policy in addressing this challenge? I think, um, First and foremost, multilateralism is key. These are global issues. The fight to eliminate child labor is a global issue. And so global dialogue and cooperation is critical in order to identify global 
solutions to this uh, shared fight. So organizations like the International Labor Organization can be helpful from a policy perspective and critical in setting global standards. The standards create a global shared understanding. We're seeing for that 182 has, um, uh, Convention 182 has universal adoption, universal ratification. So there's a universal global um, uh, shared vision um, and um, standard on what the policy actions um, should be. Um, ILO standards apply to governments. Um, they ratify them and then they pass national laws which apply to businesses and that businesses must follow regarding uh, child labor. National businesses and global companies like the ones who are USCIB members that may be operating in those jurisdictions. So number one, multilateralism and global approaches and shared understanding is key. Number two, national level implementation is critical. So in terms of policy at national level, we're talking about legal frameworks, regulations, policies, critically in um, it, as it relates to the issue of child labor, education policy and access to education and following through on ensuring that children have access to education, social programs, social protection systems. Um, so that's kind of the policy framing that is key um, that we need to see at the national level, but more than just policy, then we need the next step of implementation. And that's what that gap that I mentioned earlier, the, the ILO statistic of 152 million children still in child labor is highlighting. It's all well and good and critical that we have the global understanding, but then we need the implementation at the national level to really affect change. And there are challenges. Um, there uh, is poverty, there's wide scale informality um, and a range of other um, uh, factors that hinder this um, implementation. But um, policy actions and in implementation um, of those policies are a key like enforcement um, national coordination among key agencies like the Justice Department, the Labor Ministry, the Education Ministry, for example. Um, also, um, uh, enforcement related to um, minimum age for work, labor inspection um, are, are all important areas as well. Um, it's key to make sure that there are adequate numbers of uh, labor inspectors. So this entails resources, which can be a challenge for some companies, uh, for some governments. Um, and then not just having the inspectors, but training for the inspectors, resources for them to be able to do their work, computers or, or vehicles for transportation, which in some contexts, we're not seeing because of budgetary issues or other challenges. The inspectors need to have authorization to assess penalties, to um, be able to conduct their inspections in, in a way that's both routine and unannounced. And then the creation of complaint mechanisms for reporting of um, labor violations are key as well. So from a policy perspective, global policy, national level policy, national level implementation is key. And um, the approach and uh, shared vision for all of us that we need to adopt is uh, collaboration, tripartism, governments, business, civil society, trade unions, really joining together incentive programs like our colleague from the Vietnam Chamber of Commerce and Industry described. Um, and um, and a, a renewed and shared commitment that um, and an understanding that each sector is critical. Government alone, business alone, trade unions alone won't achieve it, but together we can address this. We can bring an end to child labor and we look forward to collaborating with you on that. Thank you. Thank you very much, Gabrielle. I love this. You see, we're at exactly two o'clock, exactly where we needed to be to finish your panel. So questions will come later, of course. We've got 20 minutes at the end of the other uh, panel discussion that we have. I'm handing over to you right now. 
uh, Dan, Dan Widerman, who's from the Working Capital Fund, our partner in uh, hosting this event today. Matthias, you are raising your hand. I want you to stop me from introducing Dan or what is happening? I, I, here's my guess. One thing, there's a problem with translation. So on the English channel, we have no French and on French, we have the English. So everyone, I don't know whether the translator can correct that again. Otherwise, everyone has to do it on your own. So it was just by the word. On the English channel, it was French and on the French channel, it was English. So they've been swapped around. So until it's fixed, be aware that just swap them around, but we do have the interpretation. It's just confusion with labeling. So we move over now to Dan. Dan uh, Widerman, as I was saying, is the managing director um, of our partners for today, for this event, Working Capital Fund. And he's gonna talk on what problem are we trying to solve in the supply chain management of MEs. And when Dan is done, Dan, don't come back to me, go straight into your panel discussion and introduce uh, your colleagues, and then I'll take it from you afterwards. Over to you. Thank you, Mutunzi. Um, that sounds great. And thank you to Matthias and to Monique as well for the partnership that has brought us here uh, today at this particular moment. Um, in my personal experience, having been working on issues of forced and child labor, labor exploitation with businesses for about 20 years, I personally have, uh, when I ran an organization called Verite, uh, was not frequently enough in, in contact and in conversation with the IOE. Uh, and now at Working Capital Fund, we're pleased to have established at least the first step of a, of a sort of a collaboration. Um, which in our case is highlighting and bringing some really cool, innovative, practical solutions to the table so that you can better understand them. And we have a bunch of time and mostly we're going to focus on hearing from them specifically about what they're offering and, um, and how it relates to the problem at hand. So uh, in, in general, our role, my role at Working Capital Fund is to be sort of like a venture capitalist for labor rights. We're trying to solve labor exploitation and other and child labor um, by investing in things that work and helping bring them to scale. Uh, there's a lot of good ideas out there. There's a fair amount of innovation, but it doesn't have enough capital. And so it doesn't get big enough so where it can really solve at scale the nature of, 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 um, of supply chain problems. Um, the, the, the topic of my little section, my introductory section is what problem we're trying to solve. Obviously child labor is the problem we're trying to solve. Our focus of it is uh, within that, where does child labor appear within businesses and operations and supply chains? So our focus is really the formal side of where of business sector and, and how child labor shows up. Um, and, and especially how can we leverage the power of business of employers and multinational corporations into um, greater impact on the ground. Uh, our analysis of the problem uh, as we've defined it is that it largely happens, bad thing, bad conditions, labor exploitation, child labor happens in supply chains because they are often opaque. Business partners frequently don't know who one another is. Certainly if you go from multinational down deep in its or up deep in its supply chain, um, you're gonna have a lot of invisibility. So the business partners don't necessarily know who they're connecting with over the course of a supply chain. Uh, and then the voices of those who are most affected in supply chains are generally not available. Uh, whether they're silenced or not, they're not available. So we're certainly, that's certainly the case if we're talking about children, but other workers as well. So our analysis is that this opacity sort of creates the room for all sorts of bad things to happen. And specifically what we're trying to solve, I think today with the group around the table is that the toolkit we have available to ourselves to solve that problem is inadequate. It's largely based on social audits. Um, it's, it's, as Monique mentioned, both in the context of opacity, uh, and, and governmental intervention, there's, there's really not enough. And in part, there's not enough because we can't reach far enough and we can't reach far enough at the right time. And so we need to figure out what other tools are, um, are, are available. I think particularly now, uh, that's a relevant conversation. It's always a relevant conversation for, for ethical and moral reasons. And it's a particularly a relevant conversation now for some, some very fundamental business reasons. And there's probably three of them or more. One of which is, uh, legislation increasingly puts obligations on multinational enterprises to understand what's going on in their supply chains. Uh, in the US, we're preventing the import of goods made with forced and child labor through withhold release orders. Um, globally, and certainly with great momentum in Europe, uh, there's an increased push for mandatory human rights due diligence legislation. We have, going back a decade or so, or so now, transparency legislation, which still obligates companies to at least identify what they're doing about forced and child labor in their supply chains. 
And then of course, in the last year, COVID has created this absolute tragic disruption of livelihoods, including in supply chains and employment, driving families into poverty. And at the same time, as Gabriel, as, as, as our colleagues pointed out, it's prevented us from looking where we used to be able to look, even using the clunky um, tool of a social audit. So for these three reasons, there's great urgency and we're at a sort of a, I think a key moment. We're gonna to hear today from five initiatives that are tech enabled, technology enabled. Why technology? Pretty simple, uh, it scales and it's cheap, it can be, right? It has to be developed, and, but once it's developed, it's in your hands, it's a computer, it's a, it's a cell phone, and it gives you the kind of visibility um, into your supply chain or the ability to hear from vulnerable people that was really impossible at the same scale, at the same price point, even two, three years ago. And that's not even to mention these increasingly available kind of emerging texts that you hear about, but really are fairly common at this point, like artificial intelligence, machine learning, sensors and the internet of things, uh, and blockchain as a, as a sort of a database. So we're not using technology to the fullest extent that it needs to be used to solve these problems, and it can be used, and that's what we're trying to push forward. Uh, I hasten to note, because someone will raise this, technology is not a solution for everything. It can be used as a, it can be a problem itself. It can be used to monitor people against their will. It can be used to push productivity beyond its reasonable and ethical boundaries. Uh, it can be used to supplant people's employment. Uh, and so it's not, it's, not a, it's not a panacea. It's not a solution in of it, it, it completely, but it can vastly increase our reach and our understanding of what's happening where we are concerned about by raising the voices of those who are affected. Our panelists uh, span the globe from mostly the East Coast in the United States where I am to Phil who's in Australia. So many thanks to Phil for staying up very late. Um, the panel divides kind of neatly, I think. We have uh, two initiatives which are very much focused on the voices and the experiences of workers, Quizzer and Yolula. You'll hear from Sandra and Vera in a little bit. We have Goodweave with whom we'll start in a minute, uh, which is the NGO in the room, which is very much focused on finding and addressing child labor at its source generally and often in the sort of less formal aspects of supply chains um, and then taking care of the kids as they go forward. And we're gonna hear from Sylvia about the transparency that they're using, that they're applying technology to achieve. And then at the end of the panel, certainly not, not, la not least, but maybe last, we hear from two initiatives that are focused more on providing traceability um, into supply chains and visibility from um, Lauren at Supply Shift, which has an unprecedented data set of what's going on around the world um, in supply chains and Phil, who's a part of OpenSC, which is innovating around uh, kind of the ways of looking and ways of finding new pieces of information. Um, as we said, there's lots of questions I think that'll come up. Uh, I will turn it back to Matunzi at the end. Let me jump off by uh, calling on Sylvia to dive in and tell us about, about Goodweave's work and in particular, how you're bringing traceability and transparency into the apparel sector. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dan. And thank you, uh, IOE and Working Capital for inviting me and for inviting Goodweave uh, to this panel. It's great to be here. Um, very important topic uh, and a topic that is very uh, core to everything that we do. Um, for those of you who do not know Goodweave, we are an international NGO with a mission to end child labor in global supply chains through a market-based and holistic approach that focuses on due diligence in deep supply chains, remediation and prevention. And we have over 25 years of experience in this field with operations in Nepal, India, and now also Bangladesh. The depth of the reach of our due diligence is really important when it comes to identifying child labor. When I talk about deep supply chain, I refer to subcontracted, undisclosed, informal, sometimes home-based production units within supply chains that are often not covered by brands monitoring or audit frameworks and remain invisible. These tiers are definitely hard to track and even harder to access and monitor. But our experience working exactly in these areas tells us that, that that is where child labor thrives and continues to go undetected. We work at Goodweave with over 180 brands and their suppliers to bring visibility to these hidden workers and their children, to remediate child labor uh, through education support and also to improve working conditions of all workers. How do we do this? First, we map the supply chain down to remote villages 
so that brands and sometimes even suppliers can see the extent of the supply chain. Then we clean up the supply chain by independently monitoring against our standard. We have a standard that differently from many other audit frameworks and doesn't just focus on tier one, but has requirements also for subcontractors and home-based workers. And then against the standard, we conduct inspections that are random, frequent and unannounced. And we know that unannounced inspections are really one of the best ways to uh, identify hidden child laborers and also a powerful deterrent to bad labor practices in general. And as an example of this work that we do um, is a case study that I often mention to really help people understand how, how much of the supply chain is not visible. Um, we had a large textile importers that signed up uh, to our program a number of years ago. And when they do, brands always present a list of their known production sites. So we received a list of 22 production units. After about three years of work from our team in India, we have uncovered over 1,300 previously undisclosed units, uh, in addition to those 22 that were known to the brand. Uh, including home-based units. And most importantly, this led to uncover 120 child laborers. We also support education in communities, um, which is a direct result of our supply chain work. Uh, we heard at the beginning how important it is to address root causes. Sometimes technology cannot help on that. Um, so root causes such as lack of education, lack, uh, lack of access to education, shifting sometimes the mindset of entire communities. This is something that we focus on, and we have uh, over 50 worker communities in India where we do this work. We ensure that children are enrolled in school, we support their enrollment, and we track their attendance to ensure that they do not go back to work. Because sometimes you help a child, you remove him or her from the workplace, and then they return to the workplace because there is a lack of tracking what is happening to that child. Now, all this information is recorded and analyzed. Um, and so this is going to bring me to how we use technology in a second. But I want to reiterate the point that really our work helps brands see the supply chain, see the issues within. And without the knowledge or evidence that these issues exist, that these children exist, it is really hard to have any accountability or action. So that's where I think technology solutions and digital tools can really help. They should be helped to, um, as a goal, to inform and prompt better action, uh, better action to have better impact. And that this is how we intend to make use of techno te technology at Goodweave. Um, from this quick overview I provided, you, you now know that we collect a large amount of data um, and very diverse type of data, including you know, from production units down to household units, non-compliances linked to child labor, as well as other abuses, we have data on remediation, we have data on school enrollments and learning levels in worker communities. We are using technology um, to compile all this information and analyze it more effectively to inform action. We have developed a platform, the supply chain transparency platform over the years to store, manage, analyze, report and help our team and also our partners visualize the supply chain and the risk. Um, we also use it to um, inform uh, um, you know, changes in our social, in social work. Um, the analysis of data can provide learnings that help us understand which social program may be more effective in the communities, how to change certain social programs, and also how to inform advocacy. We heard a lot of this happening on the uh, legislation, um, uh, legislation level. And so this can really help uh, uh, policymakers understanding what child labor looks like in informal supply chains and making sure this is included when policy is developed. Um, in our case, we're also proud to have, to a certain extent, control over what happens in the communities under our purview. So as I said, we can create a direct link between the information we store in our data platform and the uh, action that we take in the communities. Um, so definitely the platform helps our analysis of data, but uh, I think a point that is important to make is that 
the input of the information is crucial. And that is still very resource intensive and very labor intensive. Um, and sometimes, especially in the rural communities or in informal levels of the supply chains, it has to be collected through building trust with the workers, uh, taking into account the gender sensitivity. A lot of these communities are comprised of women workers. And so, yes, technology helps, but it's really the groundwork that happens in the communities that sort of uh, helps the impact and helps driving change. Um, just to conclude this overview, looking, looking forward on how tech can support our work more in the longer run. Um, I mentioned that we uh, are collecting supply chain audit data and community data, and we are continuously refining this platform to help get a better insight into our work. And we was to, want to also layer third-party data that can help identify greater risk to align our work and see results over time. Because another important thing is to see how child labor is being addressed, whether it is uh, um, decreasing, and if there is a lack of progress, what can we do? Uh, what can we do about it? I'll stop there. Thank you, then. Thank you, Sylvia, so much for a great example of how tech can facilitate an impact-oriented um, set of initiatives, and certainly the anecdote of, of finding this vast number of, uh, of suppliers that uh, were not otherwise known uh, is a good, is a good um, link, a good hook. I would note, um, I didn't say at the beginning, but each of these panelists will have six minutes. Sylvia did nicely. We wanna keep Matunzi happy by maintaining our, our timeliness. I'm gonna turn it over next to um, Sandra from Quizzer. Um, I highly recommend you go to Quizzer's website and have a look at the really cool soap opera style labor rights videos that they have up there, the films. Um, they're, the, they're sort of the core of the education work that uh, Quizzer does and quite entertaining. Um, over to you, Sandra. Thank you, Dan, and thank you for inviting us for this um, webinar with this very important topic. Um, Quizzer, we like to uh, describe ourselves as EdTech pioneers in social sustainability, uh, using a bottom-up approach um, to help companies unleash human capital. And, and how do we do that, you might ask. And it's exactly like you said, Dan, it's through our, uh, or one way we do that is through our educational films. Um, and I am hesitant to call them educational films, uh, like you said, Dan, they're more like live action films, short dramas, very engaging, fun, and sometimes we even describe them as light, where we try to take these uh, very complex issues um, and we try to make it easier to grasp for, for everyone who, who needs to know this information. So it's a very worker-centric tool. And what we do is we focus on the why. Um, so we offer local engaging films focus, focusing on the why and what's in it for me. Why is this important for me to know? Um, and of course, this can be different, different for different stakeholder groups. So supervisor, uh, supervisor would have one motivation and workers would have another. Uh, it will be a different thing for, for top management, obviously. But in the end of the day, um, they promote the same end goal, right? Uh, we'll give them similar terminology, uh, it will increase willingness to, to engage in dialogue and increase common understanding. So that's, that's our, our, our aim, our end goal. Um, we use a science-based methodology when we produce our films. Um, our vision is that everyone should be able to recognize themselves in our film material. Um, and we do that, yes, because we want to offer dignified training, but also because it's proven by research that you, that you learn more uh, that way. Uh, so I think that's kind of what this uh, Chris's secret sauce is that we have these amazing films, we have these um, film production teams out in the markets and, and uh, organizations that worked with us to get the dialogue on point, to get realistic environments, to, to ensure that the dialogue where the actors talk, uh, that we cover the same topic as two workers in, in Bangladesh, Dhaka would talk about during lunch break. So that's really important for us. Uh, talking about the topic of today, um, forced labor and uh, ethical recruitment, the migrant worker issue is two essential uh, components uh, in uh, Quizzer's learning maps. And we don't focus on them so much as a one topic, it's integrated in all our trainings. Uh, and that's really important to us. The same thing when we try to tackle gender equality and uh, sexual harassment, uh, we don't cover it in one training, it's, it's in all of our trainings. But we do have a training um, with ETI on involuntary work. And currently, we are developing a training with Plan USA that also covers uh, bonded labor. And another important point is that obviously we don't have in-house uh, expertise uh, just 
At Quister, we work with these amazing organizations. We work with IOM, BSR, ETI, Plan USA, in order to ensure that we have expertise needed and also cover the ILO core convention, uh, OECD guidelines and SDGs and so on. So that's really important. And what you mentioned in the beginning then uh, about reach, that's very important for, for Quister obviously. And, and in the beginning, um, we focused on doing training within factory walls. And that's super important. And training should, some training should be conducted during factory uh, working hours paid, of course. But when you talk about ethical recruitment and the migrant issue, of course, we want to reach uh, people, workers before they enter employment. And the same thing go with the life skills training that we offer. And when it comes to budget and savings uh, or migrant parenting in China, um, so we do have that and it's a great way for employers and for organizations to increase training uptake and really give something extra to their employees in that sense where family members and, and, and communities, so we can get the training up in communities and so on. So that's really important for us. And we, we have so much to talk about when it comes to our films, we have so short time. So that's, that's the educational part of Quister. Um, but we do have an equally important component when it comes to what we do. And that's uh, what happens after the training, right? Um, so when you watch the, the films, uh, it's uh, followed by a quiz, a gamified quiz. You collect coins. It should still be fun. It should be gamified uh, because it's proven that you learn more that way. And when you answer the quiz, it's not only so you repeat the lesson of the training. It's also so you can get a receipt that the training is done as an employer as, and as a supplier. Um, so as a partner to us, you log in to our dashboard. I think you can see the dashboard there on, on our slide, where you can get live data and uh, data analytics on what is the situation in this factory right now. And you can track progress. You can get, you can create training plans. Um, you can proactively, together with business partners, um, talk about pain points and also make wise decisions also as you talked about with audit scores you know it's not six months ago it's not 36 months ago it's actually live data from what's happening right now in the factory so that's something we're very proud over um how do we know that we're doing the right thing and that we're succeeding <laughs> with uh, our our path to impact well for us it's when we see a triple effect that we can trace positive um positive outcomes for the brand um, supplier management, of course, the brand, uh, the factory management, but also ultimately the worker. Um, and I would like to take the time to just pinpoint one example of that, that we have uh, together with one of our partners, uh, Electrolux, that we've been working with for a long time now in multiple markets in, with different training programs, um, where they have in their latest sustainability report seen a 7% increase in productivity and the 3% decrease in employee turnover linked to the quizzer training, which we think is amazing. And then we have a, another significant partner who reported 30% decrease in employee turnover, which I mean, it's isolated case, but it's, we're so proud over those numbers and we keep on tracking that kind of impact. So we are noticing more brands worldwide realizing um, the impact social capital has on brand equity and we're very proud of working with these uh, leaders in dif uh, different industry segments. They kind of want to change the norm in how they're working with these questions uh, in their ecosystems and in their supply chains. Um, and I don't know how I am with time. I think you're, I'm you're just about at it. So. Yeah, perfect. So then I'll finish up where we are at right now. Um, currently, we have uh, 500 factories working with us worldwide. And in a week or two, we will have 1 million trained um, training sessions. We are so proud over that. And it's all from migrant workers arriving at uh, arrival centers uh, to uh, production lines across Asia. And together with more partners, we can reach more people. So another, thank you, uh, thank you Senator. That's wonderful. Another great example of how tech can, can increase the reach and, and be situated within an impact context um, and, and hopefully be engaging as well. Uh, and now we'll turn to Vera from Ulula, which was one of the pioneers. Ulula was one of the pioneers at, at reaching out to workers using mobile phones um, and mobile technology to essentially engage them, gather their information, share information with them. Vera, I'll turn it over to you for your presentation. Thank you, Dan. And thanks to the IOE team for 
hosting this event today. Um, very timely topic as, as always. And I'll try to also contextualize it a little bit within the greater objective of, of what we want to achieve this year in the elimination of, of child labor. And of course, it's one of the most challenging ones to measure and tackle, but also probably uh, one of the most worthwhile and important topics for us to, to talk about. Um, so just a quick introduction to Lula. Um, we're a social innovation organization um, founded in 2013 and on the premise that um, digital technology and engagement should be inclusive, inclusive as we're thinking around um, innovation and the use of technology in the, the monitoring of social and labor rights risks. Um, so we've been working with different organizations, global businesses, governments, and NGOs in the last years to um, deploy inclusive and accessible digital tools so that we can hear from workers and community members that are most impacted by business and finding creative ways to ask about that impact. Um, so we, we have four key tools that we use um, from automated surveys to mass broadcasting to resources and training and actually partnering with organizations like Quizzer to provide that training um, and also uh, grievance management mechanisms that are safe, anonymous and two-way to make sure that we're also closing the feedback loop with people, not just sourcing information and, uh, and consulting. Um, and the benefit of technology here is that all of the data through multilingual, multi-channel um, aspects can come into one place in real time so that organizations have really current information. I, as, as Sandra mentioned, it's, we're not uh, often looking at data that's, that's you know, from six months away, but rather um, what people are engaging with in that moment um, so that organizations can have informed, timely decisions. Um, it's, it's really a tool that's complementary with traceability tools because we know that the challenge of supply chain opaqueness is, is really the first root um, of the, the issues. Um, we cannot really measure what we cannot see. Um, once we begin to see it, um, a tool like Lula is helping organizations begin to measure the accountability within what we're able to see and track. Um, and, and just to go to the key point that I, I wanted to make uh, um, for today is the, the aspect of inclusivity. I think as, as we are innovating and as we have the ability of, of a lot of interesting tools in machine learning and IOTs and, and blockchain for ways to host data and, and um, connect people, um, we also have to think about what is the source of entry of that data? Really, what is that first input? Um, and this is where, you know, 3.3 billion people in the world, they're still not connected to data. They don't have access to smartphones or affordable data. So for those 3.3 billion people, we have to still be designing for them. So this is where um, in our suite of tools, we're still using a lot of offline technologies. So connecting people through interactive voice response, which is an automated multilingual chatbot, as well as uh, text messaging, which, you know, require just the simple Nokia phone, I'm not connected, it could be a burner phone. Um, so it's, it's really meant to be as simple and accessible as possible. But of course, at the same time, connecting with the times and, and beginning to launch and innovate with apps and uh, chatbots on different, um, different apps like WhatsApp um, to make sure that people, you know, we are really keeping, keeping up. Um, in, in Vietnam, actually, Zelo, uh, that's, I know we've had the topic in hearing about the Vietnamese context and we're integrating with a, a chat app that's, that's specifically used by the majority of Vietnamese people. So um, really thinking around what do people use, what is accessible and how can we make sure we're not leaving anybody behind when it comes to consulting them. And then once we're connected with people and, and currently we've engaged over 1.3 million people in different supply chains from agriculture to factories, you know, we're always innovating around the instruments and methodologies to measure forced labor, child labor, human trafficking, and overall working conditions, um, including working satisfaction and, and overall worker well-being. Um, when it comes to measuring child labor, um, you know, this is a very difficult topic, quite similar to measuring um, impact of sensitive issues like harassment. We have to use proxy indicators. We have to think about how can we ask people without directly asking them, you know, are you a child laborer? Are you, are you working under forced labor conditions? Most people will say no, because people also will not identify themselves as being under that, that kind of a working engagement. So looking at ways to um, ask about 
For example, farmers being able to meet their quotas without engaging family members, or for example, um, whether children can come in and stay on factory floors. These are phrasings and ways for us to gather some of this information that could um, indicate the presence of, of child labor in a workplace. And when it comes to the ch child labor monitoring and remediation systems that have been launched over the years um, and have been quite, quite effective in many supply chains and extremely powerful where household visits and follow-ups are done in a way that's really sustainable and systematic by local field uh, officers, we do still see that we're not reaching the goal. Um, in, in, for example, in Coco and in, in Ivory Coast, a, a supply chain and a country we're going to be focusing on in the next three years quite, quite directly and intentionally, um, one in five children who are at risk of child labor are covered by these monitoring systems. So this is where technology can play a role because house visits are important. We don't mean to replace that kind of work. However, it's, it's difficult to scale and not all terrains, uh, especially in agriculture and other settings are, are easy uh, to, to monitor. So this is where mobile based accessible tools can really be a partner in the process of, of the CLMRS um, processes. And, and finally, I'll just touch on kind of the shared value aspect of, of what we're doing. Um, while we need to look at the use of technology for risk monitoring and risk mitigation, it's not just about a risk-based approach. I think it's important for us to be monitoring the impact, but also really thinking about the shared value of deploying technologies like these. Um, whether it's, it's trainings, whether it's a, a worker direct anonymous worker reporting, or traceability tools. These tools are really meant to bring um, a benefit both to workers, to compliance for business, but also they're just good for business in general. Um, direct worker engagement is, is now linked to, uh, to workers uh, not leaving the workplace, workers recommending their workplace to family members and friends. And we're beginning to associate some of the data that we have, and we have millions of data points uh, at, this, at this stage where we're beginning to correlate things like, um, you know, uh, overall better working conditions with workers' um, likelihood of recommending that workplace to a family member. So these are these are all uh, important things um, that that are good for everyone in the sector. And just to kind of mirror that, you know, tech is just a conduit. It really needs the policy and the enforcement of policy as well as procedural foundations to bolster uh, its effectiveness. Um, it's important to use technology within that context, but we're always thinking around how to expand it, partner it, link it, uh, uh, make it interoperable with other systems, uh, all in the sake of uh, achieving the, the ultimate goal. Wonderful. Thank, Thank you, Vera. That's perfect. Good stories and good descriptions of the reach. Um, we're going to pivot in the, in the panel now to talk to two people who've focused more on sort of the transparency, trace, transparency within supply chains, sort of overall conditions we've moved a little bit away from where the workers are engaging the tech directly to um, to systems that embrace a, a kind of a broader range of, of connections with business. Starting with Laura Newton from um, Supply Shift, which as I mentioned, has probably an unprecedented amount of data through the work that it does with, um, with, with brands and businesses. Lauren, over to you. Great, thanks Dan, uh, Working Capital and IOE for having me. My name is Lauren. Sustainability Solution Advisor at Supply Shift, but also previously a customer of our platform with the Clorox company. So today, how can we address child labor and decent work in supply chains using Supply Shift's Software as a Solution or SaaS platform? So as you all know, market, NGO, investor, and even internal corporate pressure has increased the urgency for companies to shift their irresponsible business practices. And most of that environmental and social risk, particularly child labor, lies deeper in the supply chain. So what is supply shift and how can we help? At its foundation, our system is a responsible sourcing network that efficiently facilitates the collection and analysis of data, primarily in survey format, about suppliers to enable responsible business decisions. So we allow companies to deliver insight into both environmental and social aspects of their business, but today I'll focus on labor. So Supply Shift is both a multi-tier network and a multi-tenant network. So imagining you're a company using the platform, multi-tier means that we can give you visibility into supplier labor performance at all levels of the supply chain, meaning back to the source. And because labor risks increase, the further you go beyond direct suppliers, multi-tier is essential in managing that risk. 
When I say multi-tenant, that means that suppliers can respond to questions once and share it not only with you, but with multiple buyers. So the staffing burden for both buyers and suppliers then is significantly reduced. And that's reduced not just for a specific issue, but also because fair labor requires systems at scale for everyone to have an impact. And that can be achieved by making the process easier and more standardized and repeatable. Now on the back end, the data collection that Dan was speaking about, we have an analytics engine that makes that data that we collect from all companies actionable by helping them see exactly what actions are needed with their suppliers. So to cover a few of the core features that SupplyShift uses to make an impact, we support first and foremost supply chain mapping, and this can help companies visualize their high risk suppliers across multiple tiers and understand the relationship they may have back to their tier one suppliers. And number two, another core feature is anonymized supplier benchmarking that'll allow companies to publish supplier performance benchmarks back to those suppliers in an anonymized fashion so they can see where they stand against their peers and understand exactly exactly which areas they need to improve in. And we also allow for layered self-assessment and audit processes. So as much as we'd like to, we can't audit every supplier against important issues like child labor. And Supply Shift facilitates what we call that layered self-assessment and audit process, where a company can set a series of flags to target their audits to the highest risk suppliers. First, they screen against region, spend, third-party data like Maplecroft or other factors that they choose and find their suppliers, their priority suppliers. And they can assess those using a custom approach that we at Supply Ship build for them or an assessment from our standard assessment library that we've developed with partners. And lastly, they can follow up with on-site audits announced or otherwise for the suppliers that display the highest labor risk. And an example of this is a program in the UK called Fast Forward that we're launching this year. And Fast Forward is a next generation labor standards improvement program that's that was originally developed by apparel retailers to address audit inadequacy. And the methodology has been refined over many years, but it's now sector agnostic, so not just for apparel. And it's one of the more well-regarded programs in the UK. And a few things make Fast Forward different. First, it's focused on improvement, not a one-way audit, and suppliers can get detailed feedback and resources to help them continuously improve. Two, it is collaborative, so buyers can share information about suppliers that they both use so they can be aware of issues and work on remediation together for a greater impact. And finally, it is software-based, so that allows it to be more scalable, save time for auditors, suppliers, and consumers of that audit data. And because it lives on the supply ship platform, that can be combined with other supply chain data like their supply chain mapping or other custom assessments to get a more full picture of their overall supplier performance. And in closing, our platform allows companies to make more of a holistic impact. Technology enables us to use actionable insights about corporate supply chains where issues such as child labor exist and to make a greater impact for less money. And to learn more about supply ship, please visit us and see what some of our labor specific standard assessments are or um, recommend them to your corporate friends. Lauren, fantastic. Thank you for almost single-handedly bringing us back on schedule. Um, with apologies to Matunzi, I'm going to give um, Phil his, his full amount of time because he stayed up the latest in Sydney. So I don't want to short, short give him short shrift. Um, That's, all right. we'll just... That's all right, Dan. We'll manage. We'll manage. Over we'll manage. Appreciate it. We'll, we'll come yeah. to Q&A if we need be. But Phil, over to you. Thank you for, for participating and, and look forward to hearing about OpenSC. I, I, I have been waiting all day for this, and it's um, but it's not yet midnight. Um, so at OpenSC, our focus is on technology-enabled verification of specific sustainability and ethical production claims. Who are we? We're an impact venture co-founded by WWF, Worldwide Fund for Nature. Um, obviously, decades of environmental conservation expertise there. Early in our journey, we saw the intersection with social issues, and that's why we sought out working capital to be one of our uh, first investors uh, in the venture. Um, I did have a slide. I'm not sure if it's up there, Monique. Um, if not, that's fine. Look, our, our basic thesis is that whilst traditional certification schemes and regulatory schemes have made significant progress in recent decades using manual processes and spot checks, technology 
is right now creating big opportunities to continuously verify in an automated way that all of production is happening in a certain ethical or sustainable way. Uh, real examples of solutions we've built are to verify that all fishing is occurring in a legal or sustainable fishing zone, or that all of an agricultural product from a region is deforestation free. Ah, there's a slide there. Um, so you can see we're up in the top right quadrant and we're evolving and building on the shoulders of existing certification and regulatory schemes. That's probably enough of the slide. Thank you, Monique. We're working on child labor uh, with some of our clients in the agricultural space. These are smallholder based production cover crops in African and Latin American geographies. I want to share two thought starters from our experiences. And the first is really about the importance of incentives and what we call proxy, something Vera mentioned um, a few moments ago. And to begin, it's challenging you know, to demonstrate on a continuous basis using technology that child labor is not happening full stop in a supply chain. That's a really challenging thing to do. You might try and install cameras all over plantations, um, you know, train um, algorithms to identify, you know, smaller figures in the landscape and whether or not they're there or what they're doing in the landscape. Um, that's challenging technology wise. And also you run into privacy issues pretty early on. But what if we can flip the narrative and start from the needs and interests of local producers and workers and from an incentives lens. For example, what if it is possible today to use technology to check continuously and in an automated way where the kids are attending school? And we heard a bit about the importance of um, that type of proxy um, earlier as well. That's what we call a positive proxy measure. And if a child is in school, we know they have an opportunity to learn. We don't know full stop that there are no child labor issues in that supply chain or region, but we do know that one key positive thing is happening and that creates value. And it also um, can be a shared responsibility across all producers in a region. Then we can start to look at, could a higher premium be paid to all the farmers if that state is maintained on a continuous basis? Um, so that's really, our journey so far in the child labor space coming from our you know work on other commodities and other uh, types of claims environmental and social into the child labor space second thought starter is you know how do we innovate successfully uh, when the topic is complex and sensitive like child labor is we always start from the you know uh, perspective that to innovate we need permission to fail so we're asking our clients and customers hey, we need permission to fail and you need to give us that. But we know that these are really sensitive topics for consumers, for stakeholders. So often organizations are concerned, they're coming in with a perspective, their internal stakeholders are saying, we must get this right. Uh, but then that means no permission to fail, which means no innovation. So we get caught in a situation where we can't move forward. From our experience, a good way to move forward is to ensure that innovation projects, technology-based projects are part of a portfolio approach. I think we heard this bit from some of the earlier speakers too. That means if a company has in place strong, broad corporate commitments, this is where we're going in three years, five years, 10 years, has in place traditional approaches, certification-based, audit-based, that creates solid ground for then innovation to be given permission to fail and to um, have space. Um, on the other hand, uh, it's a risky approach to say, okay, I want to do this innovation thing and put all your um, effort and eggs into that innovation basket. Um, so I urge all of you on, out there to consider more of a portfolio approach than a kind of single innovation approach. And that's where we've had the most success with our clients and customers. Thank you. Hey, great, Phil, thank you. Really good, um, in a sense, almost closing framing for, for how we should go forward. I'll, I'll say last thing before I hit it back to 
Tunzi, as I know, thanks to all of the panelists, uh, all really interesting stories. And, and I know that you're all wide open to collaboration with people around the table virtually. Uh, and so uh, to the extent that matches need to be made, I'm happy to, happy to help in any way possible. Um, Matunzi, back to you for the next session. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dan. Thank you to all the panelists. Thank you, colleagues. Um, as I did promise you, we've been tweeting quite crazily. I see some of your organizations have responded uh, whilst we were tweeting to retweet. I think I saw uh, Vera's organization. I saw Sandra's organization. I, I saw one or two others coming on because we try and multitask in the in the IOE and make sure these things are done. USAIB retweets all the time, Gabriela and so on. But um, in, in looking at the questions that are being asked, uh, there aren't many questions. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take, I see there is one question on the Q and A and then there's other statements stroke questions on the chat side. So I'll flip on both. Uh, on the Q&A, we've got uh, David from, from the Ethiopian Employers Federation, and he says his question is, how would it be possible to abolish child labor? Okay, that's a big question because, you know, uh, we, we, we heard from some of you that, you know, we're not winning, especially the COVID has made it worse. Uh, the digital solutions are assisting us to, to try and, and, and do what we can. And I, and I liked the words that were used, I think, by Vera about trying to expand, trying to link, trying to ensure interoperability, all those, those kind of words. But his question is, how would it be possible to abolish child labor in the near future especially in a low resource setup in terms of economies where information is not freely shared, uh, vital statistics are not well established, there's low political commitment exhibited at, at local government structures, um, no organized infrastructure that is adequate. Um, and he says, I believe this is what we are experiencing in most parts of Africa. So, any of you who feel moved can take that. If you don't, of course, I'll make sure I move you um, uh, in, in responding. Um, and then in terms of some of the statements uh, that have been made, stroke questions, um, one of my colleagues, uh, Farouk uh, from uh, Bangladesh, um, he says, uh, he's asking this from now Vietnam. Now I hear that VCCI's, uh, um, our colleague from VCC, I think, had stepped out and there was somebody who's in his place. I hope she is there. I think somebody called Tran or maybe um, um, Vin is back. And he says, what is the plan of the Vietnam government to eliminate child labor from the informal sector, specifically developing economies, he says, and the LDCs in Asia, Africa and Latin America have huge informal sectors and maximum precarious employment, including child labor, takes place in the informal economies. And because Vietnam is a developing economy, he would be keen to know about their plans of eliminating child labor, specifically in the informal sector. So this is also a question in the informal sector. Um, and my colleague from MEDEF, um, uh, bonjour, bonjour, N. Um, Anne has asked a question that I think has been addressed, but you know, you may just want to elaborate. And she says, what is the impact of the COVID pandemic on this important challenge? Because I think most of the guys covered this. And that's why we, uh, I think when Dan started, he said, um, he's not saying that technology is the panacea, it can never be. But the one thing though that we do know is that we do need to get into the digital environment to be able to find some ways of getting around the challenges we have in the physical world. Of course, uh, if I may add another complication for you guys is to say, well, digital solutions, great. But what do you do when you have such high levels of inequality in the world with the digital gaps that we've got? You know, because there's a big, big, big difference uh, that we are dealing with. Um, and then uh, the other question is also on, awareness building. So what is the awareness building and incentivization that is provided for parents of poor families um, in making sure that children go to school? As he says, these have been found as an effective way of contributing to the elimination of child labor. So we'll leave it to those questions. Um, whoever feels moved must move. Vietnam is specific, so Vietnam can respond. 
um, uh, the Vietnamese chamber can respond to that. But other than that, anybody can respond, including you, Dan, as the moderator. I mean, I'll, I'll, I'll throw out one response, right? Uh, and I, I, I hope this was clear from the beginning, you know, the, the solutions that are represented around the table are, are specific to uh, addressing the way in which the private sector can increase its influence, the way in which the private sector can understand where risks exist and can take action to solve them. And I think we heard eloquently from the folks as to how it can be, they can be applied in kind of nuanced ways. Um, they are they are not necessarily applicable for all situations, right? And and in 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 places where there is truly no connectivity, um, you know, where uh, where where there is no where the, where businesses do not extend, uh, the the way in which these solutions will come around the table will be very different than if they're trying to implement themselves within kind of um, informal or formal business relationships, right? So I just I just want to be clear that we're kind of mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. cutting off a. a a, a still pretty substantial chunk of the problem, but it's of course not uh, a replacement for uh, effective government uh, governance and and um, you know and, and much broader po a poverty alleviation among among other things. Thanks, Dan. Um, who wants to take a stab at the others? Uh, Sylvia, Vera. Yes, I am. I'm happy to um, to address the question on the COVID nineteen uh, impact as well as how. Can we support the children education in these difficult times? Uh, and I'll try to do that like in a few minutes. Um, we have conducted research uh, uh, with workers in India and Nepal last year. And we observed that 60% uh, um, of the workers that took the survey um, saw their income uh, uh, disrupted. And one in four owned a debt to someone and they were not sure they could repay their debt. So we're talking about adult workers, but this is important because this really directly increases the chances of these people to be caught in debt bondage, so forced labor, and also the need for these families to have the help of their children to increase their income since their income is disrupted. Also schools have been closed. And so 100% uh, of children were out of school and some families mentioned that children may not go back to school because again, they're needed to support the families. And this is affecting girls and women more than boys and men. Um, in the villages under our purview, we have tried to support the children through e-learning. And this was an, a very interesting experience. And I'm, I'm sure some of you have children who've done e-learning and it's really tough, but I don't think any of you had to cope with issues such as not having a phone or not having an internet connection, which is what these children in these villages have to cope every day. But we have you know, provided lessons through WhatsApp and made sure counseling the parents, making sure they allow the children to use the phone for a, let's say an hour a day of, of studying. So these are some of the ways we have tried to address this issue to ensure learning levels can stay up. They have definitely worsened, but not as much as we expected. Thank you. Thank you, thank you very much, Sylvia. I hear that we do not have anyone from the Vietnamese chamber so I think anyone who has experience on Vietnam, um, I mean, Sylvia mentioned Nepal and other places, uh, please try and help us in responding. If you have any knowledge of what's happening um, in terms of Vietnam, what the government is doing. There's also an additional question here whilst uh, uh, one of you is still looking at responding to add one additional question, because I think it will be the last one as well before Matthias has to come and close. Uh, this is a question from Henrik Enoxen. Why is there still a hesitancy from employers, sourcing companies at all, to pick up tech tools and a more data-driven approach to work towards solving the issues at hand, especially given that manual way of working, social auditing at all are increasingly provide insufficient and sometimes do not take workers' voice into consideration? Why is the hesitancy in terms of your experience? So who wants to go for this, uh, Sandra? Phil, we've kept you away. Gabriela is raising a hand. Okay, Gabriela, you go for it before I go to the other colleagues. Thanks. So, um, I mean, I would just push back on Hendrik. I mean, what we heard today is that these innovations in technology, which are helping with transparency and supply chain, are being funded um, by uh, private sector uh, contributions and other. Um, and also the clients, right? The client base is, is multinational corporations. So I would just put, push back a bit for Henrik on, um, on that, 
Is it enough? Um, do we want to see more companies um, taking the opportunity to, to use these innovations and data-driven approaches to, um, I mean, I was just struck by the wonderful story from Goodweave on going from 22 to 1,000 in terms of supplier identification. Of course, um, I, I really also appreciated some of the um, recognition that technology alone by itself isn't the silver bullet. I appreciated some of the comments I heard about the need and importance and passion and commitment to trying to find solutions for all workers everywhere. Today we're talking about uh, children who should be in school, but you know, just broadening, um, if I may, Matinzi, um, because we're talking about data, what we know um, from the ILO, from the UN, from the World Bank, um, what we know is that the greatest barrier to achieving human rights for people everywhere is this persistent root cause challenge of weak rule of law in the jurisdictions in the countries where some of these abuses are most prevalent. Mm -hmm. And so, um, States have a key role, Dan mentioned that. Um, states alone and just implementation alone from governments won't be the answer. Business alone with technology, even if all the people were using all the technology alone, that won't fix it without the role of the government. And we need civil society as well. I would just point out that, um, this is my last point, Matunzi. What we know from the ILO, right, is that um, only five to 10% of workers uh, who are employed around the world are actually linked to global supply chains. So because we have a commitment to addressing child labor and forced labor and bringing and increased human rights uh, achievement everywhere, we need to look at all of the country, all national holistic approaches. And that begins with good promulgation of laws and effective enforcement. Um, John Ruggie talked about a smart mix and I think that's what we're talking about here today. The use of technology and the role of the private sector in supply chain due diligence, the role of government, the role of civil society and trade unions and worker voice um, and uh, converting our commitments into action, especially this year, um, the international year for addressing child labor. So. I hope that's helpful, thanks. Thank you, thank you, Gabriela. I guess, you know, uh, Matthias knows this, we always have to do follow-ups to these kind of discussions because they tend to reveal a huge level of pregnancy. The more you talk, the more you re realize some of them come bearing gifts that you did not know were there. And some of them, of course, you know they are there. Because I think one of the elements we find within the human rights, business human rights space, certainly for many of the events that some of us have been to, is that sometimes it's not necessarily a hesitancy. Sometimes it's a resource issue. It's a matter of where you are, which region you're in, what access you have or do not have. Similarly to the governments, um, what looks ostensibly like the government's passing the buck to business is sometimes not because they are refusing to do what is supposed to be done at national level, but because they have an issue with not being able to be resourced enough. You, you know, they have so many other priorities and you may think, my God, how can you have a priority that is better than child labor? <laughs> well, if you've got issues of poverty all around, you may want to lift that one and say, well, let's deal with poverty first all around. Uh, if you've got issues of violence, for example, you may say, well, let's deal with that and make sure that we get all the criminals into jails. You know, so there's many, so many competing things that need to be done. The COVID has released, has revealed that even when you talk about violence, violence it is violence now that targets gender that targets women specifically, you know? So there's so many things that now that we have to deal with. So I think we may need a follow-up, Matthias, to this conversation because there's a lot of other things we may need to cover. And I'm cognizant that we have one minute for you to close. So over to you, Matthias, to close so that uh, we don't keep Phil for too long and other colleagues in that region and they can please go to bed. Over to you. Thank you so much, and that will be very quick. Yes, the good news is indeed many more of these of peer learning is going to come. We have heard from the pledge from Rita, who have pledged that we as IUE will not only have this award for innovative practices with regard to child labor, but also engage in a serial of peer learning throughout the year, because that is really, we don't want to have just an event, we really want to have impact on the IE side. 
And the context of our engagement is, of course, the year for the elimination of child labor, but it's also the 10th anniversary of UN guiding principles. And the UN working group is developing mm -hmm. at the mm -hmm. moment the roadmap for the better uptake. We from the IE side have really supported this roadmap. It will be launched with the IE on the 21st of June. You can mark it in your calendar. But again, it's not about having a conference. It's really about being committed all together to move change forward. We have to make guiding principle word. It's of critical importance. And the last thing is, it's really about collective action. We, our members, USCIB, you have heard, VCCI, you have heard, and many others are really committed on the ground to work with companies to, um, to trigger change. But there are also at global level different networks. And one is the ILO Child Labor Network, and Ben Smith is on the call. You can just text him directly if you are interested in that. It's a multi stakeholder initiative to drive change with regard to child labor. We have the ILO Business Network on Forced Labor, and Laura Green is there. Um, from um, the um, business network on forced labor, just in send a quick message that you want to follow up on her. It's also a great initiative in order to work, work together on that. And then at the end, the Alliance 8.7, Tunti already mentioned the great work the ILO is doing there. It's Thomas Wissing who is in charge. I'm not sure whether he's online, but otherwise just text Ben Smith and he will bring you in contact. So thank you all. We will come back together in these kind of meetings very soon. We will keep you um, updated and over to you, Tunti. Thank you, thank you, Matthias. Mine already are posted on the side to all panelists and attendees thanking them for supporting us and coming to this uh, uh, event that is partnered with Work Working Capital Fund. Uh, Matthias, we look forward then to partnering with you more. Um, and this for us is very passionate work that we do in the IOE, which I said we've been doing for years. Um, every year we find that the biggest problem is not business, by the way, that is organized business that attends the meetings that we go to, because those are the ones that are, are converted. You're preaching to the converted. They go, they make efforts, they want to make things happen. Our challenge is to get to those who do not come, those we do not know where to find. Those are the ones we need to focus on the most, not the people that are on the call today. These are not the people. The people here are just here to keep it alive and keep it going. But what we need is those people who are out there to bring them into this family that looks at responsible business conduct and make sure that things happen okay. It's now 3.02, so I think I need to release all of you. And thank you very much for connecting and goodbye, colleagues. Thank you so much. Thank you, thank IOE you. and Working Capital. Fantastic. Thanks, Thanks, Thanks panelists. Thank bye you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.